11 o'clock Eastern time. And so let us begin with a prayer so that we can not lose one moment. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who calls us to walk in the way of love and who models and prepares the way for our restoration, reconciliation and repair of relationships and the world. We give you thanks for gathering us this evening. We pray that your spirit would move among us and give us open and listening hearts. Help us to hear your wisdom speaking in this room that has brought us together across the miles. And may we be inspired always to see the work of living our baptismal vows as the work you have called us to do in service of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good evening, saints. <laughs> it's so good to be with you. Thank you so much for making time to, for this really special convention workshop. It's lovely as I peruse the gallery of faces here on Zoom to see so many of you gathered for this workshop. And really, um, it's, I would say that every time you're able to gather with Dr. Catherine Meeks, we are um, in God's good hands and are blessed already. And so I want to share just a little bit about um, her. For those of you who may not know her work, you must know that she is held in high esteem across the Episcopal Church and beyond for her leadership, particularly in helping us understand the work of dismantling racism as something that's about our formation and about our living our baptismal call. So um, you may know that she is the executive director of the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing, which is this great resource that came out of the diocese and is situated in the Diocese of Atlanta. Before that, it was uh, the beloved Community Commission for Dismantling Racism for the Diocese of Atlanta. And I was privileged years ago when I worked for the Bishop of Chicago to bring several members of our anti-racism team to spend two days with her and to meet with her commission to learn how to do this work in a way that's really deeply rooted in our discipleship. She is a sought after teacher and workshop leader, as you know, she brings four decades of experience to the work of transforming the dismantling racism work in Atlanta and the core of her work has been with people who have been marginalized because of economic status, race, gender, or physical ability as they pursue liberation, justice, and access to resources mm -hmm. that can help them lead and to lead them to health, wellness, and a more abundant life. This grows out of her understanding of her call to the vocation of teacher, as well as her realization that all of humanity is one family which God desires to unite. I hope you all know that these are um, attributes and experiences that will be helpful to us as we live one of our pillars of mission in the Diocese of Indianapolis, which is about not only standing with the vulnerable and marginalized, but actually transforming the systems of injustice that keep people on the margins. And so there are books under Dr. Meek's name that you should um, you should know and read Living into God's Dream, Dismantling Racism in America. She's the co-author of Passionate for Justice, Ida B. Wells as Prophet for Our Times. And um, we are delighted to be at your feet, Dr. Mason. So sure. without further ado, I will turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Bishop Jennifer. I'm so delighted to be with all of you and to be with you again. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. I was so disappointed when the last time you were in Atlanta when we were still traveling and I couldn't uh, be a part of the event but I heard many wonderful things about it and, I, and I'm so glad to be together now even through this medium and it's really great to be with all of you and thank you for taking the time to come and spend this way but more importantly than that thank you for taking the time to attend to your own souls because this basically is what you're doing. And it's basically what we're doing when we try to work for the liberation of our sisters and brothers, we're working to liberate ourselves. And when we understand that, it places the work in a completely different mode than when we think we are doing social justice or we're doing something 
for somebody else. One of the things that I'd like to see the church do is to stop talking about social justice and just talk about being the church. Because if we would be the church, there would be justice. There will be, people will have what they need. People will be free. Nobody will be marginalized because we will be respecting the dignity in everybody and working for justice and peace on the earth, as we have said, we are committed to doing. And it, you know, people often ask me, how do you do this work? I'm 74 years old. I've been doing this work since I was, actually since I was a kid in college. So for the last 50 years, but it's because I've always been, at least for a lot of my life, clear about that I was trying to do something to help save myself. And so that made it an easier journey than just thinking I'm, you know, I got to do this because I believe that or whatever. So, and whether you're white, black, brown, or whatever, all of us have got places in our psyches that need to be liberated. All of us have got places where we can't see as clearly as we need to. And God's intention for us is that we see clearly. And so in, in those places where we can't see clearly, we are challenged to do something about it. We're challenged to become conscious. We're challenged to wake up. So I wanna start uh, with a piece of poetry because I believe as my poet friend, David White says that poetry is a language against which there is no defense. And I believe that poetry is often a better way to get where we're trying to go than prose, particularly if silence wouldn't be better. If, if um, it's been said that we should not speak unless our speaking improves upon the silence. And I think that if, we, if, it, if speaking will improve upon the silence, then poetry will improve upon the speaking. I feel that, that connected to, uh, to the language of poetry. And this piece comes from one of David White's books. Uh, some of you may know David White. The book is called The House of Belonging. And it's actually a poem that he quotes from another poet, but I think it says a lot about this time of pandemic that we find ourselves in. Actually, I should say, I almost I wanted to make up a word. I don't know if pandemia is a plural of pandemic. I don't know whether that's true or not. There'd probably be some uh, people in the, some, some wordsmithers in the group that could tell me about that. But what I, what I want to say is that we are in the midst of multiple pandemics right now. And, and sometimes it almost causes us to lose our heads because we don't quite know which way to turn or where to, how far, where, where, do, where do we go? And I've been experiencing a lot of that with, with my sisters and brothers in the Episcopal Church and also with people outside of the Episcopal Church with trying to face the pandemic of COVID, which is frightening and, and causes us a lot of angst and has made us have to reorganize our way of being and thinking about so many things. And then of course the pandemic of racism, which has been here since the 15th century, plaguing us, not always seen as a pandemic, but definitely has been one. And now it looks as if the climate has tried to decide, well, if there's gonna be this uh, array of pandemics, we just might as well get on this bandwagon. So we got fires and floods and hurricanes. And it's, it's hard to see this chaos as something that we need to think about in some kind of way other than just kind of, can I go under the bed and stay until it's over and let me out, when, let, let me know when it gets better. So I want to, I want to read this poem as a, as a um, kind of a comment about that. And then I wanna say something about what, what I think the chaos is about. And then, then I'm gonna go ahead and talk some about um, racism in particular, I ask you to watch the film 13th. I don't know if, if people had a chance to watch it. If you didn't, it's, it's uh, there and you can certainly watch it later. But I wanna talk some about the implications of that content and then do a little bit of work around um, a glossary, <clears throat> which has been noted in the chat for you. And then talk, have you watch a little um, spoken word piece that one of my staff people did, which really summarizes a lot about the struggle uh, against racism for her and other young black people. And of course you can generalize what she's talking about 
to any group of people of color. And then we'll spend some time after that with my engaging your questions and comments. So we'll have some time for a bit of conversation. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a, a how things will flow. This poem is called Lost. And the poem is uh, based upon a story from Native uh, Americans, or I prefer to say indigenous people's culture. This boy, little boy, is asking his grandfather in the story, uh, what do you do, grandfather, if you're lost in the forest? And then the poem is a reflection of the grandfather's answer. So the question, what do you do if you're lost in the forest? And the grandfather says to the little boy, stand still. Stand still. The trees ahead and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger. You must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes, listen, it answers. I've made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again saying, here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. So what do you do when you're lost in the forest? Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. So here we are in the midst of a lot of chaos. Of, and if you are not in the midst of it, I, I want to hear where you have been managing to live because uh, all of the rest of us have been in the midst of it. So what is what do you do? Do you, you know, people have written to me and called up and, and people a little, some people a little frenetic about what to do, how to, where to go, which way to go, what should I, how, how, you know, how do I navigate? And standing still might sound like an invitation to do nothing, but it's actually an invitation to pay attention to the invitation that the chaos is presenting us. The chaos is, I see it, is an invitation for us to do a lot of interrogation of ourselves, re-examination, reflection, asking ourselves some different questions. I think that uh, I'm not, I'm never going to say that I think God is sending stuff to, you know, disrupt us and kill us off and all that. I think that's too, that's an oversimplification of trying to understand reality. But whatever comes is coming and it's here. And then we can either stand still and hear what the invitation is for us, or we can fight it and flail around and be like we're uh, kind of being swept away by the storm. The, there are a lot of images that have come up for me in this time. And one of them is the tumbleweed that you know how you've seen tumbleweeds in the old Westerns where they're just being blown about. They've kind of picking up stuff as they go. You can be that kind of, you can be in that kind of space, or you can be like in the swirling of a hurricane, or you can find a, a, a core, like, you know, they say at the, at the eye of the hurricane, there's, there's quietness, there's stillness. So you can be finding your way to the eye of the hurricane and sitting and listening to what is the, the still small voice of God for you and for what you are supposed to do. So I would invite you to think with me as we uh, engage in this conversation tonight, you know, what are, what are the invitations that's being given to you in this time? What are the invitations to you personally? And what do you think is the invitation to the church? I believe that the Episcopal Church is being given a new invitation to engage and I think that it's going to be important for us to pay attention to that and, and to try to understand what it means for us and not to just kind of hope to keep our heads down until the trouble passes over. In the beginning of all of this, particularly with COVID-19, I think in a lot of circles, there was, there was a bit of a feeling of this will go away and we can just manage to, to in whatever way we can until it goes away. 
And now we, six months later, we're still here, 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 you know, this is here. So, so we have learned a lot, like learning how to be together in this way with me in Atlanta and you in, in, in varying places. We've learned how to reach out to people in different ways. We have learned how to do church in another kind of way, or we've, or we've not learned, but we've been forced to have to do it. And so what else is there to learn? What other invitations? What is it that we, how do we need to reshape the ways in which we've been approaching our, our lives in the world? You know, what are the questions? What are the, what is the new direction? These are all questions that I think we need to be engaging. And what we tend to do as human beings is like to find our little places where we can camp out, where we don't have to ask questions. We got it figured out. This is our little path. We're on it. We know what we're doing. And let us just go do it. But this kind of time forces us out of that slot, forces us into a new mode, forces us into having to interrogate ourselves in ways that we may not have before. The ways in which the, the response to the systemic racism in this country has clustered around this virus has been pretty amazing. And I think we, paid, we, we find, find ourselves being jolted harder by the, uh, the racism because we're already more feeling more vulnerable because of the virus itself. I'm not so sure that we would have seen the same kind of response to George Floyd's lynching that we saw if we hadn't already been in the space of dealing with COVID-19. I just think there was a vulnerableness in us and also people were at home and, and, not, and paying more attention to what was going on. But it feels like the galvanizing of that energy around that whole situation had a different kind of power to it than it might have had if, if those things hadn't been happening already. But that's neither here nor there, because the fact is that we needed to be galvanized and we needed to be standing up to the plate and paying attention in some different ways. And, and we need to be really focused on creating a world where we don't have this kind of thing happening. And of course, none of us on this screen can fix all of this our, by, our, by ourselves, but all of us together can certainly keep on standing very strongly in the commitment to stand against a world where if somebody thinks it's all right to murder somebody in broad daylight, particularly when, you're, when you have been told that you're supposed to be protecting people and serving people. We have got to create a, we have got to create a, 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 um, a sense of what is acceptable and right that would make it impossible for somebody to make that kind of decision. And, and it's gonna be a while before we get there, but we've got to hold that as an intention. So what is the invitation to you personally? What do you need to think about? And what do you need to um, imagine for yourselves in order to move forward? I know that you are reimagining things for, for the diocese and that you've got a, a, a set of uh, mandates that you put out for yourselves that I, I applaud that, I think that's wonderful. But I think those things only will be worked with to the extent that people are willing to work with themselves. That, that we can create all kinds of wonderful ideas and mandates and, 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 and um, goals or whatever you wanna call them, pillars. I think you someone mentioned that word. All of those things are wonderful and necessary. But the, the basic work starts with the reimagination inside of our own hearts. How do we get from where we are to wherever else we need to go? And no matter how wonderful we think we are, we've all got some more distance to go. You know, we didn't get there yet. We're still alive. And as long as we're alive, we got some work to do. All of us. So it's so so it's okay to just be ready to admit to, yes, I'm I'm in the struggle. I'm I've got things to learn. I need to be open to what are the new conversations I need to be starting? What are the new questions do I need to be asking 
in order to accept the invitation that's being offered to me in this era of multiple pandemics. Because all of us are being challenged to find a new way to see. The way we were seeing before COVID-19, the way we were seeing before 2020, isn't gonna work in 2021. It's just not. I mean, I remember the first series of, of workshops we did on lament from the Center for Racial Healing were done because I, someone called me up and said, you know, there are just a lot of people that are just trying to wait, just think they can wait this thing out. And they just wanna get back in the church house and get back to normal and get back to being who we used to be. Well, I'm here to tell you sisters and brothers, the way we used to be is gone. It's gone. And that's a good thing because we need to be more of who God wants us to be. We do. And so what am I willing to do to help make that new thing that God wants to create possible, whatever that is? What am I willing to do? Has got to be a question that each of us finds a way to answer because otherwise you end up just trying to do something because somebody told you you need to. And most of the time we do some things because somebody told us we need to for a little while. And then as soon as we can, we escape. And you don't want to escape from this work. We don't want to escape. We want to do this work. And I wonder if all of us sitting here are able to imagine our country as a place where we've done this work. You know, can we imagine ourselves being the place where we respect the dignity in everyone and, and work for, for peace and justice on the earth? Can we imagine that as, as who we are? And I oftentimes, uh, when I try to do this with myself, can't imagine it for the whole country, but I surely want to imagine it for the church. I want the church to be a place that's on record with trying to create this space where if you walk in on Sunday morning smelling bad and clearly coming from having slept under the bridge, you will find the love of Jesus and you will not find criticism. You will find empathy, you will find acceptance, you will find that people are able to see beyond how you smell, how you look and, and, and see the face of God in you. That's the church I want to see. That's the church I want to be a part of. When we have that church, this country will be different. And then we will have gotten closer to being able to create a place where we respect the dignity in everybody. There are a few things that need to happen in order for that to happen. And one of them is that we really have to make our peace with that there is one God who has created everybody and that everybody is equal. Because we still are, as a, as a people, we're still dancing around with that edict. You know, We say it, but way down deep inside of ourselves, we think there's some folks that are better than some other folks. And, and I want to say really quickly, I want to be confessional here and say that I've got some folks that I wanna put on a spaceship on a one-way trip. You know, I, they need to be off the planet. I would. That, that would serve me better if they weren't on the planet. That's my little, you know, woman inside that wants to try to deal with folks without really having to let God deal with me so I can deal with them. And God just waits on me to get over it and says, well, you can want what you want, but they're here and I love them. And guess what? I love them just as much as you. And I, how could you possibly love them as much as me? Don't you know what I do? And look at what they're doing. But the fact of the matter is, it's true. There is this God of the universe who is not split up into millions of little pieces with some children, children that are considered to be better than other children, but all children are God's children and God sees us as equal human beings. So then that's a, that's a you know, let me tell you something. The first time that struck me, I was driving here in Georgia somewhere many years ago and I had to pull my car over and stop on the side of the road because I had to really ponder that because I was kind of just holding my, you know, all of us that are good and blessed and kind of into that, uh, God's gonna bless me because I'm so good. Well, really? 
No, that's not quite the way it works. So we have to make our peace with that. We have to come to grips with, do we believe that? And then if we, if, and not only do we believe it, but has it settled down into our souls so that no matter who we encounter, we don't start by looking at them through a lens that ends up being judgmental or putting them on some kind of scale, but we start looking at them through the, through the eyes that see a part of ourselves in them because we see God in them. That's part of the first work. <clears throat> the first thing, it, the, the next thing is to work with, what, why is it that we are able to have this notion that somebody deserves to be a second or a third or a fourth class citizen? Where do we come, where do we learn that lesson? How do we get caught in that kind of thinking? Where, what are the narratives? What are the stories either told to us, it's subtle stories or overt stories that helped us to come to the conclusion that, they, that, that some people just, you know, just don't quite, they just don't quite good enough. They just didn't quite do enough because all of us are here because of grace, God's almighty grace. So none of us can quite do enough. And so who am I to start deciding that you didn't do enough and that's why that's happened to you and it didn't happen to me rather than understanding that there's mystery in the world and I don't understand why it didn't happen to you, didn't happen to me, but happened to you instead of blaming you for it or assigning blame to you or responsibility to you. This is very related to how we begin to dismantle racism. A part of the way that we keep systems of oppression intact is by finding justification for them in some kind of way. It may be very subtle. You may have to interrogate yourself very deeply to discover where it is that you come to a space where you can justify something that is not defensible. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not making any assumptions that there's anybody on this call that is feeling like they, that they're somehow perfect. I'm making the assumption that all of us are here understanding that we're all wounded people and we're just trying to help each other get to the best bandages. You know, I love Henry Nowen's book, The Wounded Healer. I love the book, but I love the title almost more than the book because the idea that you could be a wounded healer, that no, no matter what, who you are, we've got wounds. And, and some of us are further down the road with discovering the bandage closets maybe than some of the others. And the thing is that then we need to have a generous spirit with telling people that, that good news. You know, you're back there with, in that closet, but let me tell you, there's a better closet down here. And I found it and I want you to know about it. And so come, let me help you get to it. That is waking, helping people to wake up. We want to wake people up. We want people to be, help people to become more conscious as more parts of ourselves wake up and decide that it is indeed better to see everybody as a beloved child of God than it is to split people up and have hierarchies and categories and to be trying to relate then to people on the basis of those hierarchies and categories instead of being able to really see people as being um, a part of God, having seen God's face in them. Seeing the face of God in everyone takes some intentionality. You don't just wake up that way every day. You know, some days I don't wanna see God's face in anybody because I just wanna be grumpy and I wanna just see people the way I wanna see them and I wanna have my little pity parties and whatever other kind of parties I wanna have. And I might have a whole day of that and just being a grump and, and okay, nobody's perfect, but do you know what? You don't get to camp out there and, and start hosting parties with your grumpiness. You have to say that, you know, yesterday was just that kind of day and I'm, I'm back on the trail now. I understand where I'm supposed to be. I know where God wants me to be and let me turn to God and ask for God's grace to help me be back on the pathway. Oftentimes I talk to white people who talk about being scared to um, 
engage in around race because you don't know what to say, or you might say the wrong thing, or you might hurt somebody's feelings. But the basic thing I think is that you might make yourself look bad. I think that's the basic fear, the fear of, I'm, if you wanna say the wrong thing, well, what's, how is, what is that about really? The wrong thing that would make me look bad because I just don't know, or because I think I know, and, um, and you know, and and you got just a little bit of consciousness, but not enough, not not much courage. A little bit of consciousness and not much courage. Well, the main thing to do is to work on being an authentic person, to be authentically as connected to the truth inside yourself and your own um, understanding of what it is to be a human being and how you want to be treated because nobody wants to be marginalized. Nobody wants to be denigrated. Nobody wants to be oppressed. There is nobody on the planet that has gotten to be a grown up and said, well, I think I'll go try oppression out for a while. There's nobody who's done that. And there's nobody who wants to do it. You know, I have sat with people who've tried to convince me that people want to be homeless. People don't want to be homeless. People want to be free. And sometimes people don't want to be in shelters and other situations that we think they ought to be glad to be in because they can't be free there for whatever reasons. They're not saying they don't want to have a home. They're saying they want to be free. So nobody wants to be less than, than they can possibly be just like you don't want to be less than you can possibly be. And one of the biggest problems we have in the United States right this minute is having the capacity to have empathy for one another, particularly across lines of difference, because we have othered people so much until we forgot that everybody is a human being. And basically everybody wants the same thing, to be free, to have access to resources, to live their lives in the best ways they can. You know, there may be some people, I mean, people who have mental illnesses or people that are uh, heavy, heavy into drugs, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about people that are basically just trying to live their lives. And if they don't speak the same language as us or don't cook the same food the way we do or dress the way we do, or if they are a different color or have a different understanding of, of themselves as, as, a, as who they are in terms of gender, we think you're a man, you think you're a woman, it doesn't matter because you are a human being and you basically want to have a chance to live your life. When you start seeing people that way, it makes life so much simpler because then you can engage with who you find there, who is in that human house, who is in that human house. And you don't have to try to make up that story. You can let them tell you themselves. I love the notion of letting people just tell me who they are. And until you tell me that, I don't know who you are because until you tell me who you are, I'm making up a story about you. And that's called projection. I'm projecting you into an identity that I didn't bother to let you talk to me about. I decided who you were based upon where you went to school or which side of town you live on or what color your skin is or how tall you are or, or what your gender is or isn't. I'm making that all up, it's all in my head. And it's all really about me, it's not about you at all. We do so much projecting because human beings do projection. We just do that. I mean, we, we see somebody, our brain is wired that way that if it doesn't have all the information, it'll make up something. Your job and my job is to interrogate the story we're making up. To say, now I'm driving past this person on the freeway. They're in this Maserati. They look like they're 12 years old, so they must have stolen this car. Well, maybe they did and maybe they didn't, but I'm making this all up because I don't know. Maybe this is a person that looks a bit way younger than they really are. Or maybe they did steal the car, but I don't know because I'm in my car. And, and so as soon as I catch myself and say, you just sat here and told, you, told yourself all that stuff and you don't know a thing. That's, that's the job we have. And that's what waking up helps us to do. Waking up to who we are and how we make up stories on people 
and what our prejudices are and what our fears are helps us to realize that our projections are made up stories about other people. And if you are going to be serious about creating a space where people can be who God put them on the earth to be, you have got to be dealing with this stuff inside yourself. That's the first work. That is the first work. And there is a real propensity in all of us not to want to do the first thing first. Please, for God's sake, don't let me have to do the first thing first. Let me do the second thing. Let me do the third thing. Let me do 15 other things before I do the first thing first. And in this case, the first thing first is turning our inner intention toward the work. And I don't mean in a peripheral way. I mean in the way that says, what am I willing to give up so this work can happen? What are you willing to give up so that the Diocese of Indianapolis can become a better place for God to be manifested when it comes to racial healing and justice? What are you willing to give up? Nobody can answer that question for you. And I would never attempt to answer that question for any person. But what I will say is we have to be willing to give up stuff. We have to be willing to let go. If nothing else, we have to be willing to give up some of our preconceptions. We have to be willing to give up some of the ways in which we have learned to be afraid. You know, what are you willing to give up? And, and I would love for you to uh, be willing to engage this question as you go forward, as you go away from here tonight, as you go into your uh, convention and as you go into your work, because it's, it's a question that, that we have to answer more than once. You can answer it and you have to, and for me, the answer is I'm willing to always stay willing to be asking myself that question so that I don't get stuck. Because if I think, oh, I gave up a whole lot last year, so I must be done. No, what I gave up last year ought to make it easier for me to give up what I've got to give up next year. And the year after that, and the year after that, because you learn to live letting go. And you know what? It's good practice for the day when we're asked to die because letting go is the, is the biggest thing you got to do when you die. It's just letting go of this life. I used to teach um, classes on death and dying. And I finally realized that one of the best ways to prepare for the big death was to engage the little deaths a little better and to let go, to be willing to change to, to a way that I thought was the only way I could be in the world, to let it go and to see well, what might come. And my life has gotten better and better. It is better at 74 years old than it's ever been before. And I'm way different from I, what I used to be. The, the core of myself is the very same. The person who's always stood for, with the marginalized because I was marginalized. I am a black woman in America. And if I don't understand my marginalization, I'm never gonna be a conscious person, you know, but, but, now, but now I am an empowered woman who still chooses to be on the margin more than anywhere else. But it's a choice now as opposed to an assignment. But I understand, I understand that though I am an empowered black woman in America, there is a constant a force that thinks that I'm in the wrong place that I'm not in my place, that I need to be put in my place. And so I live my life with that understanding and I'm ready always to do whatever it takes to move to greater liberation for myself and for others. So you stay, I stay prepared with living with open hands. That's all God asks us to do anyway, right? And it's just easy sometimes to forget that. So we start holding on to stuff and thinking we gotta, we gotta you know, well, I can't let go of this because it might be the end of it. No, nothing else might come. And I just the other day had this whole little conversation with myself about things I'm ready to let go of. And if God says, yeah, you got, they, they've got to go, then they go. And sometimes what you discover is that they go and something so much better comes back. And sometimes they go and nothing comes back because you didn't need to have, your space needed to be empty. There needed to be empty space 
so God could use that empty space later for whatever God chooses to use it for. So racial healing involves um, a lot of self, self awareness, uh, a lot of willingness to listen, a willingness to let go, willingness to interrogate our story, the way we make up stories about people, which is called projection, and a willingness to always stay open to listening to the questions that come to us, and an and a effort to find a way to be empathetic, to have real empathy for people who are not free, to have real empathy for people, for, for, for any of us to have real empathy for people requires us to be willing to be vulnerable enough to, to walk in somebody else's shoes without judgment and without projecting, but to just walk in their shoes and to see how those shoes feel. And most of the time when we do that, we're glad to get back our own shoes, right? When we really do it. But it's, it's, sympathy is a whole nother thing. I mean, that's a, that's a part of sympathy is projecting, you know, too. But, but to, to just take all that back and to just be with somebody, just stand with them. So if you can just stand with people that are not free, when you think about those 545 little children that uh, they can't find their parents now because our government acted like it lost its mind and separated those children from their parents. And now these children are orphans in our country. When you think about that, how do you feel? And where does it, where does it lead you? And yeah, you can get mad, but that's beside the point. You got to get more than mad, you know, because getting angry is just can be like fear. It can it can keep you from doing anything. It can make you immobilize. It can make you think you've done something because you used up a bunch of energy. But then what can you really do? And the next time there's a conversation with somebody white, if you happen to be a white person about you know, people of color and the ways in which we don't treat people right. And you may have found yourself in the past being a little quiet in that conversation. Then when you think about those 545 kids, maybe you should be a little fiery in the conversation. Maybe you should be a little fiery in some conversations. Maybe there's some new conversations you need to engage. I, I'm just holding up possibilities here. And each person has to kind of see where do you where does where do you fit on this this line here? You know, am I um, one of my priest friends told me that um, back when we started uh, taking children from their parents, he spent on one of the Sundays he prayed for the children that were being separated from their parents and for the and for their parents. And at the end of the service, he had parishioners who were actually upset at him because he was praying for those children because they somehow construed that to be a, a slap in the face to them or to people, to, to their, uh, under their political stance or whatever. As a person of faith, if you find yourself defending indefensible behavior like that, then you need to spend a little bit more time with Jesus to, to find out what Jesus, to look at how Jesus behaved. You know, last week I had the wonderful pleasure of engaging in a conversation with the presiding bishop. And one of the things he said was, people always, you know, they made all that, they made a whole industry out of what would Jesus do? You remember that, that, that I mean, back, I think it was some years back, but it turned into a whole industry and we kind of got away from it some, but, but every now and again, it rears its head up again. And Bishop Michael said something that was so important it's not important to ask what would Jesus do. It's important to ask what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? And what did Jesus do about the marginalized and those who were othered and those who were sent out to be second and third and fourth class citizens? Of course, he was one too, as far as the Roman Empire was concerned. So you want to you wanna make the you want to make the world better. You want to create more freedom and equity. You want to be living into your baptismal uh, promise more fully, then you have to start with who lives inside of me? Who's in this human house that I occupy? And how did these 
ideas and thoughts get here. I like to talk about that as the inner community. You know, who's in, who's in my inner community? Who, who is here? And, and when we do that and answer that question honestly, then we can start hearing what the contrary voices are going to be when the work gets challenging. Because when you start a new work, it's always exciting and everybody can get on the bandwagon and it sounds like such a good idea. And oh, and particularly right now when it feels like the country's going to hell in a handbasket, it's like, whatever, what can I do? I know that frenetic energy that I was just talking about when the, when the grandfather to the little boy says you stand still, when you stand still a while or when you engage it for a while, because you see COVID's gonna go away and we're gonna restore things and stuff is gonna even out. And we're gonna get back into another space where we can rock along a bit and, and rocking, rocking along, if you're not careful, will look inviting. It, it can, it, the only way it won't be inviting is if there's a disturbance in your own status quo then there won't be any chance of getting back on that pathway of kind of rocking along. And um, so I just, I know myself that the work is hard, that it's challenging, and that there are many people who start out with a gung-ho and then they get down the road a little bit and it, and they, it goes away, the energy goes away. So it's important to find out what you really are called to do. You know, I don't know if you know the, the wonderful theologian, Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman is somebody that has been just a, a, a bedrock for my life and my journey. And it's an African-American theologian from Florida who grew up in the era when getting an education for black people was really a hard, was hard to do, but he, was an amazing human being who read all of the books at the Morehouse Library when he was a student. That just gives you a clue that I don't think the library was as big as it is now, but he read all of their books when he was a student because all he did was go to school and study. And he talk, talks about that a lot. Well, in the 60s, during the 60s movement, the young people, young black leaders thought that Howard Thurman was going to be Moses for them. They studied him, and they and he, his, his his theology is so amazing. And he, when you heard him speak, you just were transformed, and and still can be transformed by his tapes and CDs. But he never he never joined them in in any protest. He never got involved in that outward work like that, because he knew what he was called to do. So his call was to write and think and do the things he was doing. And so the young folks, of course, got a little, some of them got a little upset because they thought, they, they said, we thought we found Moses and he turned out to be a mystic. And it was really a disheartening to some of them. Well, some of them were a little bit wiser than some of the rest of them. And the wiser one said, but how would Thurman helps us to understand why we are out marching. Howard Thurman helps us to understand what helps us to go do this. So in order for the work to be sustainable, one has to understand at the core of oneself, why you're doing the work. Why are you getting engaged? What is it? And what is at the core? And, the core, and it cannot be um, much expectation for success. You know, we, if I, I was in a class and this, this white man was just so upset when we were talking about white privilege because he had worked with black folks that weren't grateful to him. You know, they, and he just couldn't understand why they didn't understand what a good person he was and, and were more accepting of him and he was becoming embittered about it. He has to do his own work. He has to do his own work so that he ends up doing whatever he does for anybody else because it has something in him has pushed him to be that kind of person as opposed to doing it so, so something comes back or they do something because that can't ever be the way the equation is set up if, you, if there's gonna be sustainability. So now the, 
the other thing that I want to be really clear to say, and then I want to move on here in a minute to 13th and to the glossary, is that this work is about all of you and me helping to get our own selves out of prison, helping to get our own selves more closely aligned with God's imagination for who we were to be when we got sent to the earth. Howard Thurman said that about working with poor people, that if you didn't understand <clears throat> that going out to be a generous person and trying to help people who were poor was about liberating yourself, then you misunderstood what you were about. And I think that, that, that it's so important to, to pay attention to this inner work because we get so caught up with outer work. We're so, we, we love to, to, you know, it keeps us busy, it makes us feel good. Uh, we can plot our, our success a little bit anyway. But if we don't do the inner work, it's kind of like you sent your persona out ahead of you to do the work, but it was an empty shell. You sent yourself out to do the work, but you didn't send your whole self out. And so then, there's a space in between that person out there doing the work and the person who really lives inside of you. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever had a, a, the experience of there being somebody that you just thought the world of, kind of maybe a little bit of a celebrity person, you know, could be a priest or it could be um, a teacher or somebody. And then you, you, had the, you thought the world of them, you looked at the stuff they were doing and it was just amazing and you just couldn't wait to meet them. And then you met them and you just thought, who is this person? What, what a disappointment. I remember having that experience with folks that we would invite when I first started working in the university, we would invite speakers and I thought the world of them from reading all the things they'd done and having heard them speak. And then they would come to campus and you just this broken, pitiful, antisocial, almost nasty person showed up. And I'm thinking, who in the world are you? And I was sometimes so sorry that I even met them. And they sort of taught me a lesson. I don't have many folks on my list of people that I just really think I need to meet because I think maybe I just need to stick with, I know you from afar and that's good enough because uh, when th that's happened more than once. But the way you avoid that is to make sure that your whole self is connected to what you're doing. So when somebody engages you, they've got all of you. They're not just engaging a persona. They're not just engaging the overcoat. You know, they're not just engaging the public person. They're engaging you with your strengths and your weaknesses. And so they encounter a whole person and you are conscious about those weaknesses and willing to be vulnerable enough for, to allow people to engage them. That then brings an authenticity. It's this kind of authenticity that Jesus had that made folks running after him so much. Every story we read, almost every story we read about Jesus, he's running from people. And, and look at us, we're always trying to feed the next campaign to get folks to come to church. Jesus was the next campaign to find 10 minutes when he could get away from people. And then when he, remember the story when he got in a boat and went across the way to try to get away from folks and he got there and they were waiting on him. I mean, wonder, what a wonderful problem to have in the one, on the one hand, but what a statement about being this authentic person that people want to be around because when they encounter you, you help them to be more of who they need to be. And, they, and people respond to that. So then when we go out into the world saying, we have got to have justice in the world, we have already been made clear about that inside of ourselves. And we require justice for ourselves. Thus, we require justice for everybody else. And it's got to do with our spiritual formation. All of this work is about us becoming the people God wants us to be. And when, when we have that attitude about it, we don't, there's so much, there's so many questions that just go away because there's no sense in asking them anymore. 
I'm doing this work because this is what I have to do. I'm doing this work because I want to be well. So right up there with what am I willing to give up is do I really want to be well? Do I really want to be well? And, and I have had to ask and answer that question for myself many times as a person who suffers from rheumatoid arthritis. I have to ask myself when I wanna you know, have a um, ice cream party all by myself with haagen do I really wanna eat this big old bowl of ice cream and then have to be stiff because of the way dairy affects my joints? Or do I think maybe I should have a, um, a, an apple or something, you know? And, and how well do I wanna be? You know, how many sacrifices am I willing to make? Do I, do I really, do I really wanna do this? Remember Jesus asking the gentleman at the pool of Bethsaida, do you want to be healed? When he lamenting about not being able to get in the water because nobody will help him. You know, when the angels come to trouble the water, they won't help me. So I can't get in the water and what a pity it is. And, you know, if he'd been talking to me, I would have joined in lamenting about these people being self-centered and thoughtless and a whole bunch of things. And Jesus said, do you want to be well? So as you work on moving more deeply into this work, one of your basic questions is, how well do I want to be? Do I want to be well? because it's directly related to all of us getting well. And what I, have, what I have experienced now in the nine years since I've been doing this work in the diocese in the Episcopal church is that there are white brothers and sisters in our church who don't think this work has anything to do with them, who don't want to hear about it and don't think it's got anything to do with them and want to label it as political so they don't have to do it. And I'm here to say, that the work is about spiritual formation. It's got to do with everybody and nobody is exempt. Black, white, brown, nobody is exempt. That we all have got to do the work of opening ourselves up to God's complete liberation to the best of our ability while we are walking on this earth. And I don't know what happens when we leave this, this iteration of life, but I guess the way life works that it maybe continues in another kind of way when, when we go on to the next world. I don't know about that. And it doesn't really concern me right now because I'm here. But I do want to say, if you have people saying, you know, it's the 21st century and we had a black president, why are we still talking about race? I mean, I'm sure you've heard that because I can't be the only person that's heard that. And also, we are so quick to say, well, that's politics and we don't wanna talk about politics. Only do we wanna talk about politics when it's in our favor or when we want to raise the subject. We've got to quit playing those games and we've got to get on the right track. And the right track is God's church needs to be a light in the world that shines so bright that people can see that the darkness is not the only thing that exists. And we are responsible for bringing the possibility for that light to shine. Because God only, God's only, god got us human beings here claiming to be his vessels, claiming to be the folks who are willing to, to allow that light to shine in us. So, and that's, you know, that, that makes it clear to me, it makes it really clear to me. And I don't have to be in a whole bunch of debate with myself. I just have to be trying to find, be open to the grace that makes it possible for me to do what I'm supposed to. And I'm not, always, I'm not always able to do it. And grace holds me up because God is loving and kind and forgiving. And instead of trying to denigrate the journey because I don't wanna take the journey, I can say, Lord, help me. Help me to be who you want me to be. Help me to be willing to be a well person and not have to be trying to say, why are we having to talk about this? I can't tell you how many people uh, wrote, uh, recently we did a series of webinars on, on reimagining policing and public safety that were public, uh, publicized at the National Church, on the National Church, uh, the, the Episcopal Church Facebook page. I can't tell you how many posts there were saying, why are you talking about this? You should be talking about Jesus. Why are you talking about this as politics? Well, talking about reimagining public safety and talking about 
getting to a point where police officers don't think it's okay to lynch people and people don't think it's okay to shoot policemen down because they hate them. We need to create a culture where folks in uniforms can be respected and where the folks in the uniform respect the people that are not in uniforms. And it's our job to stand in the middle, to stand between the folks who on both sides and say, there's a better way to do this. There's a way to see this in a different way and where we can all become the, where we can all acknowledge that there's only God's children here. And some of them have on uniforms and some of them don't, but they're all God's children. That's our job to be that voice in the middle rather than on either, either side yelling at the other side. I was a little bit dumbfounded at how many folks wrote those kinds of disparaging messages. So I finally, I usually try to ignore that stuff, but I finally got tired of it. And I just wrote back under every one of them, this is about Jesus. This is about Jesus trying to save lives. This is about Jesus trying to create spaces where people can see God's face in one another. This is about Jesus trying to create a public safety culture that really is about public safety, both for law enforcement people and for citizens, because we're not picking and choosing here. We are talking about everybody because that is our work to be caring about everybody. All right. How many people did get to see the movie 13th? Okay, good. 13th is, is um, of course, a very powerful statement that capsulizes all of the stuff I've been talking about. It, it, it brings you right up in, into your face, the, the ways in which we have um, institutionalized this negative energy that, has, that supports this indefensible system of supremacy. 13th shows us how these things are, in, how slavery, how slavery and the and lynching and mass incarceration and the death penalty and 21st century police killings intersect with one another. 13th helps you to, to understand perhaps a lot about the prison industrial complex that you didn't understand before. If you hadn't seen that movie or done some research along these lines, some of the, the um, intricacies that are involved in the ways in which the prison industrial complex has become a prison industrial complex and, and the root system all the way back to slavery when we started police forces in the first place to be uh, the catchers of black folks. And then it moved into brown folks and, and of course poor folks. When you start seeing the complexity around all of that, then you begin to understand a little bit better what you're up against. And, and what you're up against, which is why I spent the first hour talking about the stuff I've talked about, if you don't get this inner stuff straight, what you're up against will get the best of you. It will, because you throw your hands up. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, whole, it's a whole highly designed strategic plan that's working well. That's what you need to, that's a part of what 13th helps you to see. It is a strategic plan that is working well. People are getting more than rich. And, and the idea is to control black and brown people. And so that strategic plan is working. So that's, that, knowing that helps you then to know when you start trying to do this work, you're destabilizing something that's been thought out pretty well and has a whole lot of commitment to it. And not that all of you are gonna run right out now and try to see if you can fix the prison industrial complex, I understand that. But the, even no matter where you enter into the, to the construct, just know that the system of oppression of, of systematized racism is a system that has no intentions of giving up, no intentions whatsoever of giving up. And so anytime we become resistors, then we will find ourselves engaged in a struggle that requires something of us. And we just better be prepared 
to know what is required and what we're willing to give, which is why I asked that question before, what am I willing to, to let go of? What am I willing to give up? And, and these are asking you a lot of questions because these are the questions that we half the time don't wanna talk about. We just wanna say, here, we're gonna do this. You know, We're gonna go into, this is our plan or we're going to this neighborhood or we're gonna do this work. Well, that's all well and good and people do need help and we should give people help as much as we can, but we don't, we don't need to do it and be blind and unconscious and not have some sense about what the whole picture looks like. So, and so we can be careful and clear that we don't claim victories that don't, that don't belong to us because just because we brought lunches to people and feel good about it, doesn't mean we did anything really, except somebody had a sandwich that day. And it's a good thing they had a sandwich, but they need more than a sandwich. They need, they need an opportunity to be a liberated person and to become the person that God put them on the earth to be. So <clears throat> I would like to encourage you to use 13th as a, as a catalyst, to watch it again, to, to, to get together with two or three people and talk about it, to think about using it with yourselves in, 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 uh, in terms of across the diocese in different parishes to help people start unpacking the complexity of the issue and, and to, to get on board with being open to learning more rather than to thinking that you kind of got it all figured out. That the reason why we've got more black and brown people in prison in this country than any industrialized nation in the world is because we've got the worst people. That's not so. It's because we, it's a strategic plan for control that got started a long time ago and it's working well. It's working well. And, and so, and, and do we want that plan to be interrupted? Yes, we do. And are we gonna destabilize it completely? No, we're not, but we can cause it trouble. We can cause it trouble. We can, we can make it harder for it. We can resist it. We can speak up about it. We can you know, find out who, who, we can, who we can bother in, in order to help with interrupting that negative energy. So uh, I, the, the, I wanna talk about the glossary really quickly here. And then I want to have you see this lovely um, little spoken word piece. I shouldn't say little, cause it's not little, it's, it's maybe about 10 minutes. And my, uh, one of my assistants wrote this piece and it's just absolutely beautiful. And it's available on our YouTube channel at the center. So after you see it tonight, if you think about it being a, a place, a, a tool that you could use in any way, please go to the YouTube channel and, and, make, and make access, take, take it, access it for yourself because, or anything else that's on our website, the Center for Racial Healing, website is merely centerforracialhealing.org. And when you go there, you'll find our um, access to our podcast, uh, to the YouTube channel, which has got the webinars we've done. Uh, the recent conversation that I did with the, P, with the presiding bishop will be there uh, in a day or so. So it, it's a website that we hope is helpful to people and we want people to go and use it. And, and anything you find on our website, it's yours. You can use it, you know, um, it's because that's it, where it's a tool and we hope, hope to help put things there that can become a part of people's toolboxes. The, the, the glossary that I, that I uh, shared has a, just a couple of things I wanna highlight and then we'll go to the, to the video. Uh, th there's a definition of prejudice and racism and I want, you to know how important it is to look at those definitions and pay attention to the fact that racism and prejudice are two different things. And people often use them as interchangeable words. And we'll talk about uh, prejudice when somebody being racist, when you really mean that that person is prejudiced because they don't have the power to make their prejudice a, into a system. So racism is is a system of advantage based upon race. Prejudice is making up your mind without all the facts. And you can make up your mind without all the facts and have no power to do anything about it. So if, you, if I say, 
I don't like people who have blue eyes. So what? I don't own any systems. I don't, I'm not in charge of any systems. So if a blue eyed person crosses my path at the very best I can do is just dislike them. And my dislike is probably not going to amount to much. But if I can keep them from getting a car loan or a house loan or keep them from getting a, um, a particular place to live or keep them at, or, in, or impact what kind of sentence they get when they come into uh, court, then that's a whole different thing. And I then am impacting their lives in a way. So the systems in this country have been constructed to advantage white people, the judicial system, the economic system, the political system, the education system, you name it. They were all geared for white people with white people in mind. And then when black and brown people came along, they, when we come up against those systems, we are at a disadvantage because of the superiority, the white supremacist element. So prejudice and racism are two different kinds of energy and need to be looked at that way. The other thing I want to highlight is the white, white privilege is about white skin privilege and not about white economic privilege. White people are quick to say, I didn't have any privilege because I grew up poor and we had to struggle and we didn't have you know, much of anything and our lives were really hard. And I get that that is the case for many white people. But when, you, when, you, when it's all said and done, you're still a white person in a country that assumes that if your skin is white, you're better than if your skin is not white. So then you, you have an advantage over a black or brown person because your skin is white, never mind that you grew up poor. And, and so we're talking about privilege in terms of skin and not e economics when we talk about white privilege. Internalized oppression is an, is an energy system that people who are oppressed have to struggle with because we end up a lot of times buying into the projections that are made upon us by the majority culture and, uh, and assuming that those things are true and real and then acting as if they are true and, and it does damage to us because then we become, and then, we, what, then what we do is project that back out on people who look like us. So we don't, oh, we're not always good or kind or generous or, the, or whatever we need to be to other black and brown people because we are projecting onto them the, these negative attitudes. And you see this in the, in the uh, ways in which sometimes in communities of color, people are not as supportive of one another as they need to be and not nearly as helpful as they need to be because they are projecting a lack of respect and, and worth for folks who look like them because they've internalized those projections upon them. Uh, I think that is a very unfortunate thing and it's something that it is another piece of work that we have to do in the black and brown communities to get people to start withdrawing that stuff and realizing you're living a narrative that, that doesn't fit you. You're living a narrative that is not supportive. You're living a narrative that you don't even know how you learned it, but it's reinforced by the majority culture because if you go to court and you have um, harmed a, another person of color, your sentence will probably be less than if you harmed a white person. So you're being, so you're being reinforced with the notion that the black or brown person is not as important as a white person. It's, it's a very um, difficult thing to try to navigate because it's about getting way deep into somebody's soul and, and for them to try to figure out how they really feel about themselves. And we don't wanna do, we don't wanna do that work because we wanna be okay. So we wanna just say we're okay, but we're not okay. And, and so we've gotta start naming these things. And as James Baldwin has said, you may not be able to fix everything you name, but you won't fix anything that you don't name. And so it's important to tell the truth and then to see how, what you can do about that truth. And then implicit bias is the, we added implicit bias because so many folks in our training groups were asking us in our dismantling racism training groups were asking us to talk about implicit bias, but it's important to understand these different kinds of ways of being biased are basically grounded in 
the othering spirit, the understanding that people are not as good as. So you carry this and implicit means that it's unconscious to you. And so I think that um, it's good to know these words, implicit bias in these categories, but you need to understand that that comes out of a root system that is grounded in, in a supremacist attitude, the attitude of somebody's better than somebody else. Some, you know, that, that's, the basic, that's the basic bottom line to say that this person's better because their skin is white than somebody whose skin is brown or black. That, that's really the, the crux of this. And that's what gets us into a world of trouble. And you have been so marvelous to look like you are present. I don't know if anybody has taken leave inside your psyche and your body is just sitting here or if because you look like you're here and I'm gonna believe that you are. And so I want to just take a, 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 take a turn now and ask Laura if she will uh, play the, the, the spoken word piece that we have call, uh, called My Black Life. And then when I come back, when we finish that, I would then be interested to hear your questions and comments and let's talk together a little bit about all of this stuff that I've been saying and also how it has been striking you. Thank you, Laura. My name is Stereotype. Judged and justified by the color of my skin, I secretly wonder if we can ever be friends. I'm the shade of black and brown. I represent legal systems that have sought to keep us bound. Biases, they plaster me with their colors. Are you redlining the color of my skin, making access harder because I have to fight systems from within? housing, education, criminal justice, just to name a few. Unconscious bias shapes the world and systems around you. Same offense, different life sentence, the criminal charge was being black from the start. Sentence to black maternity healthcare issues because the real issue was the color of my black skin. Now I'll admit, sometimes I feel like one third of property returning us back to our ugly historical ancestry. And I want to cry from within. Can you hear my pain? This pain, it leaves me numb like Novocaine. Nick, knack, patty whack, give a dog a bone. Cause I'm constantly reminded that we have greater regard for a dog's life than my own. Melanin, the color of my skin and all that comes with it. Microaggressions, painful connections, pressure to be something I am not. White America, pain of my ancestors, and the lineage of inequality continues. Housing inequality, Eurocentric curriculums that says to me that my black history is an elective and is optional, just like I am. Eurocentric curriculums, shaping young minds to perceive one side of the story, never telling them that we are all worthy, and that's privilege. All kind of taglines, assumptions, and guidelines to make me acceptable. Targeted by the police, trying to prove that I too am worthy of release, because he suspected that something about me looked suspicious. Racial profiling, never considering that I am falling. And I have a panic attack on the spot. How did you afford that car, he asks. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? Why are you in this neighborhood? This is a nice car. Are you sure this car wasn't stolen? Give me your license and registration now. Then I'm reminded that I don't have a license to be here. His gun is so close to his hip and even closer to my heart. So yes, I'll confess, I was antagonized by the suspicion in his eyes from the start. I held my breath, 
praying to survive this encounter. This is the story of so many I know, stopped while black, breathing while black, driving while black, eating while black. I'm constantly reminded until my veins crystallize blue because I can't breathe. So no, I don't have the luxury to go about my day in silence. Not speaking up may cost me my very liveliness. And it's the small things, like the fear of going to my white friend's home because I was told that her father hates black people and that because of his biases, we could never get along. But I'll tell you in nicer words, you see, to attempt to preserve parts of my own humanity because he couldn't see me as human. He saw my black skin as a threat to human society. He saw me animalistic and he felt it was his job to hold people that look like me in captivity. I heard what my friend said, but I figured that I'd go to her house instead. Hiding and not free, I wanted to call my mom to get me. Constantly on my mind, I had to keep looking over my shoulders to assure I'd be fine. Fond for this black skin I was born in. I've had several experiences like these. If not managed, that paranoia can bring a person to their knees. Constantly looking over my shoulders, holding my purse far out so they don't think I stole it having to look them in the eyes, hoping they'll remember that I too deserve to survive. When driving through certain towns, I will admit I take the long way. I know better than to drive through certain towns. I seek to save my life, so I take the extra time to avoid the rounds of bullets to the heart and possibly to my skin because the person who stopped me failed to realize and see that I too have a soul within. 911, what's your emergency? The emergency is me. Cold blooded killer, no technology this time to affirm me. So my blood screams out from the ground, seeking for someone to name the ugly truth so that we may begin to reclaim our grounds. And in your line of questioning, don't forget to question what culture has taught you about me. No, I don't care for rap music. I prefer country and R&B. Can you stop for a minute and not judge me? Watermelons, cotton picking, and no, I'm not a great dancer, but I dance anyway to remind myself that I am freer than any of my ancestors. No equal representation, code switching for protection, perceived as a threat trying not to regret this black skin I was born in. Guilty until proven innocent. The law has been reversed and it also reversed my innocence. I had a fear of being judged, so I lived my life in tension. Finally realizing that I can never convince someone else of my own significance. Made in the image of God, I am not inherently more dangerous. I am not more violent. You don't have to be fearful of me. I am not an animal. I did not come from a monkey and no, I cannot wash my black skin off. Surprised I can speak with the eloquence you see? These are just some of the things that plague me. Worried for my brother, crying for my mother, missing my father as well. If you haven't gotten the picture at this point, it's all from a hateful, wicked, white supremacist system. Can't you tell? Amnesia. Why don't you remember? You don't see the daily effects of how this traumatizes me or my family members. Look closer. Don't you see that modern day excuse for captivity? I long to be heard, but I'm told to be silent. After all, I'm better off than they were. PTSD, post-traumatic slave disorder and I fight it every day. I fight the internalized oppression that tells me to just throw up my hands, give up and walk away. PTSD. Even science shows I remember my ancestors' trauma in my body's cells. That they are in prison cells. The criminal justice system is going to hell and I fight the thought that things will always be this way. 
Like Rosa Parks, we've parked in our comfort. We sit on different parts of the bus. We live in two different realities. When we stand up, they hang us. Hang us with their foot on our necks. Get your foot off of my neck. A modern day lynching, a reminder to subject. Gasping for air, when will we realize that this is not an exaggeration, it's an egregious reality for those in countless locations of this great USA. The new Jim Crow internalized oppression, I'm constantly reminded that many will never view my black life as a blessing. Land of the free, home of the brave, but when I choose to speak up, they tell me to sit down, shut up, and behave. It's better than the massa, though. He beat me with a sword of rings and a lynching rope. But is this emotional pain still worthy to be healed? Are the wicked systems that kill still worthy to be revealed? Torn down, like my soul? No Negroes, dogs, or Jews allowed. But when a black man is beat down, dogs get better treatment than he does somehow. We justify it. We call out his criminal record from a rigged system that prepared him for this. Anger is raging, hatred is taking, no Negroes, dogs, or Jews allowed. That same history still separates us now. You see, telling my story does not victimize me. It is, in fact, the only way that we can start to really be free. Fear and assumptions keep us apart, but now there's a clarion divine call to reset and restart. This will only happen through relationships. They serve as a mirror for our biases and flaws. Together, we can tear down this wicked system of white supremacy that oppresses us all. Hello, my name is Unity. We don't all have to be the same to be free. Your color can benefit my color so that all colors can be free. And your privilege does not have to be used to weaponize me. Meaning well is not enough. Systemic changes will forever change the trajectory of black births. You don't have to feel guilt or shame. Instead, use your privilege to ensure that my life and the life of my ancestors will not be in vain. Stereotypes annihilate unity. Are you understanding that you have a choice into whom you will be, how you will respond, what you will do, if you will allow fear and silence as complicity to paralyze you? So I ask you again, what is your name? Remember, we all stand on the backs of someone's shoulders. Just make sure you're not standing on our neck. So Dominique did this piece for um, our youth group and it's been shared now thousands of, we've had thousands of views around the country and you can see that it's it could be used easily because it's short enough to show and then spend as a, 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 a catalyst for conversation. And I, she raises a lot of the issues, she summarizes in some ways a lot of the issues that I've been raising in the time that we've been talking today. And I, I, I believe that we've got to use all different kinds of mediums to help us with uh, opening up the conversation around race. So film and poetry and po um, drama and music and art are all tools that we need to use more. Uh, so anyway, I don't wanna take up more time with me talking, I wanna hear what I, this looks like there's been a lot of activity in the chat box. I can't, I can't really pay close attention to the chat box and talk at the same time. I haven't learned how to do that yet. So I'm, I'm good. I'll, I'll go through the chat and ask folks who might want to 
pose a question. I know there was one very early on, but um, please put your questions there and I'll try and field them for you. You don't have to write. Great, them. great, great. So let's see. There was a question way back about um, what do you think might be good and effective ways to speak to work with and inspire and be inspired by younger members of our church families, perhaps in this work. By and younger, developed, younger? Yeah, by younger people. I know you've developed that youth curriculum for mm -hmm. this work, but are there ways in which we should be looking to our younger members, um, perhaps inside and outside the church as we do this? Yes, I think that we need to become we need to develop a lot more intergenerational conversations. And we, the, the Center for Racial Healing has developed a youth curriculum that can be used with six to 12th graders. And so if anybody's working with young people the, the, in that age group, the, that curriculum is there. And there's a, you have to go through, our, uh, to, through a regular dismantling racism training and then train another day's training to use the curriculum. And we are planning to develop a curriculum for uh, kindergartners through fifth grade so that we'll have all the way kindergarten through through 12th grade for young people. And so that's that's there. But one of the things the center has been doing is trying to do things in an intergenerational way. So I started an intergenerational racial healing group that was made up of people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and the oldest person in the group was 80 something. And so, and, it, and I thought we were just gonna meet for like a year, for nine months. I asked them to meet for nine months. We're still meeting and now it's been nearly two years because it be, turned out to be such a valuable thing for both the, the older people and the younger people. And I think that teenagers, children, all of them have plenty to say. And if we ask them to say it, they'll say it to us, particularly if they really believe we wanna hear it. So I think that talking to young people is the first step and talking to them with an understanding that you're gonna value what they tell you and having them see you respond in that way and ask them what they, what they think, what they, they've, they've got, you know, we think, we say a lot of times when the older folks die off, racism will be gone and the, we need the old people to die. I've heard that more than once, you know, some, some of the folks that are the most, uh, have racism most ingrained in them. The truth is, it does, it does not matter. Racism is a system that's baked into our culture. And, and there are plenty of people ready, young people ready to take up that mantle because they're being taught that that's what they're supposed to do. So young people are struggling too with ideas and attitudes in their school places and wherever they happen to be with some of these same things. And so it's real important to hear what their struggles are. And so talking to them, creating spaces where they can participate and uh, allowing them, supporting them in their own uh, sense of, th they often have a sense of injustice that we wanna uh, control because it's challenging to us. So it's important to not do that, to be supportive of them. Thank you for that. Um, intergenerational spaces are, but the church can be one of the few places where we interact that way. Mm -hmm. Even though we might limit not having as many young people, the, to the extent that we do, we don't often have other places outside of church to do that. So right. I appreciate that. Um, particularly given the fact that um, I think parents can play a large role in helping set the stage for young children, toddlers on up to be mm -hmm. able to have a different capacity for engaging in these issues. That's exactly right. That's right. Yeah, other questions. Um, could you say more about the term social justice versus, you know, the alternative? I know you said it yeah, a little bit ago. Spiritual formation and mm -hmm. yeah, healing. You know, um, I think for people of faith, there's some things that aren't negotiable and keeping, keeping faithful to our baptismal commitment is not a negotiable. We already negotiated that and said, yeah, we're going to do it. But if I decide that I want to work for, that I want to 
go register voters this year, I can go do that. That's a social justice activity. And next year I might decide I don't want to do it because I don't quite feel like it. It's not that I don't think folks ought to have a chance to vote. I just don't want to go do that next year. But I don't get to decide that I don't want to stand up for um, people to be free and to respect people's dignity. I've, I've, it's, it's, social justice is a, is a more, it's something that can be negotiated. It can be kind of, you can tweak it. You can do it, you can leave it, you can leave it be easier than you can leave be your spiritual formation. So when you put that all that stuff underneath that umbrella of it's this is about my spiritual formation, you move it out of the category of, well, I can tweak it, I can do this much or that much. No, you, you don't get to play with it that way because you've got to be, you got to get clearly focused. So that's why I think that um, that it's important to talk about spiritual formation. That's one part. The other reason is that we like, when we start naming things as political and social, we think we can take them or leave them too. And so that's not true either. It's not about that. It, I mean, maybe you can decide that you don't want to be on the PTA. You know, that's a, that's a political act maybe or something, but you don't get to decide whether you're gonna work for respecting people's dignity. Because that's got to do not only with them, it's got to do with you too. So I, I just wanted to, I believe that this is a, a mandate that, that we as Christians have to engage in a way a little bit different from somebody who didn't make the first commitment to the baptismal promises. We promised, you know, people promised for us if we were little kids, but when we got old enough to say we wanted to do it, then we we started to do it. So I think it's, I think it's just, um, it's about perspective. It's about intention. It's about how you take something on as being a part of what you have to do in order to be living the life that you need to be living, as opposed to these are optional things and I I might do them now or I might do them in five years or I might not ever do it. You don't get to choose like that. We don't get to choose to, to pay our pledge because this is part of spiritual formation. And nobody would ever think that you said, well, it's just negotiable. If I want to pay, I will. If I don't know, we want you need to do it because it's a part of the discipline of being in this journey and the commitment that you made to follow God and be in this church and, and support this work and all that stuff. So you see, it puts it in a whole different category. And the I think it's that kind of energy that needs to be put behind racial healing so that we quit kind of wanting to push it to the side as something we can negotiate about and be optional about because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fall in that category it's, as near as I can tell. It sounds like we, we should all have our baptismal covenant taped to the bathroom mirror so we can see mm -hmm. every day what we're trying to do because it is one of the most radical affirmations we can make. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. We're really serious about it. So um, here's another question. In the spirit of John Lewis and making good trouble, how do we get past the confusion of faithfulness with politeness? Oh, good Lord, yes. And <laughs> I don't know about you all in Indiana, but in the South, we just kill you with um, being polite and, and don't want to step on anybody's toes. And um, I think that, that we have to make a a commitment to ourselves to be compassionate truth tellers. We don't, we're not going out in the world with a, with a sledgehammer to knock people in the head, but we will tell the best truth we can tell every time we open our mouths. We will just try to be truthful. We will try to be honest. And if we can't do that, we'll at least choose to be quiet. I think that, that, that if you're not gonna tell the truth to the best of your ability, then it is better to be quiet. But if you, if you keep on being quiet and never tell the truth, then you do harm to yourself. And, and, and you kill off a part of yourself after a while by acting that way. So I think that, you know, when uh, I was in, a, in the eye doctor's office and, you know, I, they got my eyes all dilated. The last thing I want to do is to hear somebody sitting in the other side of the room saying some racist stuff 
that I know I'm not going to sit there and listen to in silence. And so I, I told myself, you're at the eye doctor, Catherine, you don't have to do this. And then I told myself, are you kidding? Yes, you do. And so I had to speak up for what this woman was saying. I wasn't ugly to her in any way, but she had to hear another perspective, another way to think about what she was saying and not have everybody sit there in silence and let her think that that horrible perspective she had was the only one that exist, existed. And you take, you know, she could have gotten, she was nice enough about it. She could have not been nice about it. And, and I am kind of discerning. I don't go walking up to somebody with a shotgun and start talking to them because they might choose to kill me. And I'm not just trying to be a martyr here. But I do think that it's important to look for the opportunities when you can speak up, where you can speak up. And most of the time, we're not in, in any danger anyway of anything except our ego being hurt. You know, most of the time we, we're talking to people we know we're talking to people that are in our circle. We're talking to people that are going to be aggravated because we aren't agreeing with them about stuff. So we're trying to keep the peace. And our effort to be polite is that we don't want to ruffle feathers. Well, if you want to be a truth teller and on the journey with God, there might be some times when somebody's feathers get ruffled. And you should be, you should be, oh, we should be willing to ruffle feathers, but it doesn't mean we need to get out scissors and start cutting feathers off of people. And, and you know, because then we've gone too far, you know, even though we might feel tempted to do that, but I don't think that's one of the things we get to do. I think we can talk to people and have, we say at the center, the center is a brave space where we can tell the truth. You know, so we create brave spaces and we stop worrying so much about safe spaces. We create brave spaces where the truth can be told, which means that people may sometimes be upset. And I used to tell my students when I was a full-time college professor that if you're not upset when you get through taking my class, you need to sue me because, because I didn't do my job, because I should have taught you something that made you have to rethink some of the ways you were thinking. And if I didn't manage to do that, then I didn't do a good job. So I, so I, I think that um, being polite is not interrupting people and letting folks tell you what they think, but then you tell them back the best truth you can tell them. And that's not, that's, and that's good. And if they don't want to hear it or they don't believe you or they don't want to be bothered, you're not going to stand there then and stump them into the ground. You just have said what is the truth to them, to the best of your understanding, because you never ever know what God will do with your courageous act of speaking up. And even though it may look like it was useless, you just don't know what will happen. I've gotten letters from students that I thought my class really was, they should have gone to somebody else's class because my class just wasn't helpful for them. Five, 10 years later, I've gotten letters saying, Dr. Meeks, your class on the nature of manifestation of prejudice was one of the best classes that I took in college and one of the most important classes in helping me do whatever their work was or whatever their life is. It was amazing to me to see that happen more than once, over and over. And I, and you know, if I had to tell you, how did that student do in my class? I'd say, well, you know, they might have should have taken a, a, a uh, basket weaving class or something because I think this was a waste of their time because they struggled and barely passed the class and seemed to be having not because they weren't smart just because they didn't want to deal with the issues and yet they dealt with the issues later they were struggling the whole time and they were and they took it to heart and some of the ones who sailed through it probably got less out of it than some of the ones who were the most resistive so you don't ever know how God is using what you're saying. So it's important. It's always important to be loving and kind. It's always important to try to tell the truth. Wonderful. I'm gonna, um, I see there's one question, a couple of questions, but this one might be a good one to perhaps conclude on. And there's, mm -hmm. if you haven't been scrolling through the, through the chat, there's some really great things that people are sharing. 
um, an invitation to Brave Space has been posted that a um, wonderful piece by Mickey Scott Bay Jones. But the question comes, what keeps you grounded when despair comes knocking? Mm -hmm. And this, this era of COVID has brought with it uh, many opportunities to despair. And, and I, like everybody else, was just up in a bit of a dither in the beginning because it took a while to kind of get my bearings and realize it was sort of like a shock, you know, one day you go to work and then you get sent home. We came home and closed our offices thinking we'd be back in a little bit and six months later we're still at home. So that that was a, a, a shock and took some adjusting and my days were like everybody's up and down. But I have this uh, understanding that every day is a new day. I learned that from my mother. Every day is a new day and you don't know what God's got in mind. And if you are alive, there's a reason to have hope. Now, if you're dead, you, you're dealing with a different world from this and it won't matter. But if you are here, if you are here, you don't know what God's gonna open up for this day. So even though I was uh, in shock like everybody else and feeling the loose ends and how, to, how am I gonna run a center from my house and all of those kinds of questions. And yet today's a new day, tomorrow's a new day. And if I'm here, I will see what it brings. The other part is to understand that God is bigger than all of this stuff. You know, I do believe from the bottom of my heart that God is bigger than everything that's happening and that God is faithful. And that's what I've learned from my years of living on this earth, that God is faithful. Doesn't mean that everything's gonna go the way I want it to go or that I'm even gonna be happy about the way it all goes. But what I know is God is faithful and I, and I hold on to that. So, and I don't try to deny where I am. If I wake up and, I, and, and, I don't, and I'm in a bit of a funk, I just call it what it is. You know, I don't try to give it a dinner party, but I, but I do name it. And then I wait and see what energy will come up. And most of the time it will pass because it's not, it didn't come to stay unless you just invite it to stay. You know, owning where you are for the for today doesn't mean that's where you'll be tomorrow or six months from now, but trying to deny it just puts you in a deeper hole, really. So I've tried to be honest about where I am. And I try and I, and then I also have a practice of gratitude, which is, I think, very, very helpful. Because when you want to start being in despair one of the best ways to deal with it is to make a good long list of all the things you've got to be thankful for. And one of the most important things that I had to be thankful for is that I'm here, 220 something thousand, 25,000 of us are not here. So do I want, how much do I want to lament when I think about the alternative? For, and I don't know why I'm here and they're not, but I know that the fact that I'm here means that there's some reason and I need to be listening to try to see what it is. So that kind of um, conversation with yourself begins to set your energy free because part of despair is feeling overwhelmed and afraid and a whole bunch of things and just kind of letting it all pile up on top of you rather than trying to take a piece at a time. And and I want to be really clear. I'm a, I'm a, I've always been a little bit of a um, political junkie, so I like to keep up with stuff. But don't watch the news too much. You know, be 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 sparse in. And if it starts to get to you, just don't watch it at all because you can. It's like a soap opera. So if you miss it for a few days, it, you won't miss anything because it'll be the same thing when you come back that it was five days before, mostly. So I try to. You know, I listen to. I know there's a spirit of negativity walking on the earth, a, a spirit of, of, not, of not being able to have hope, hopelessness, and I refuse to be in that space. I absolutely refuse to be in that space. So if, if people get too awful into that, I just turn it all off and go listen to music or go read something or go play with my cat or whatever. 
So you gotta have some, you've gotta have some boundaries. So you're not gonna take everything in. And when, when people get to, it's like, I call it uh, dealing with energy vampires. So you need to watch out for the energy vampires. That's another thing I do to, to be careful about despair because your energy can get all sopped up and, you've, and you are in bad shape then and feeling in despair and you don't have any resource. And, and for those of us that are trying to be activists, despair is, is always there because we, we the, the invitation for despair, because no matter how much we do, there's always so much left to do. I never thought 50 years ago when I was fighting for the liberation of black and brown people in Los Angeles as a college student, that 50 years later, we'd be talking about voter suppression. If you had told me that, I would have said, are you kidding? No, nah, we're going to get this done. And we, th we thought we got it done. And now here we are, you know, with just this mess we've got. So, but you, you, but, but you just got to know that's, that's the way it is. The, uh, the world's always been in a mess. You read the Old Testament, you read the Hebrew Bible, there was a mess. I mean, you know, so I, I don't actually know how to explain all of that mess, but what I know is I'm here in this 21st century mess and God's got work for me. And that these are all the ways that I get myself back on the path, you know, I didn't get called to sit here and be immobilized. I got called to listen and go do what I need to do. And today I don't quite feel like it. So I don't get out of my nightgown. I watch old movies. I eat something I shouldn't have or whatever. And then I get up the next day and say, okay, yesterday was your, your, your day off. And now you got work to do, get, get with it. You know, so I talk to myself a lot. Yes, you picked up on that, right? You, it's good to have some good conversations that aren't contributing to the despair. And I wanna finish, but I think I've got enough time to read you one, one uh, other poem. Absolutely. Because like I said, I think poetry is just the best, the best thing we can do for ourselves and uh, music and um, music and poetry and remembering who your cloud of witnesses are. That, that's the other thing I wanna say. You know, all of us have got folks that we can think about that have give us hope that, they, that their existence in our lives and their existence in the world. I love the, the Hebrew chapter that talks about the great cloud of witnesses. And that, and that cloud is important to me, but I didn't really know those folks. So, and I don't know some of the others that are on my list, but I, but I do have some that I do know. And so it's important when you're doing the gratitude list, it's maybe to include some of your cloud of witnesses in your gratitude list to be reminded that those people overcame probably much more than we have to overcome. I have on my wall at work pictures of my mother and Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Ida B. Wells and Sojourner Truth and Mary McLeod Bethune and Harriet Tubman. Now, the only person that I really knew on that wall is my mother. But, but all of those women, including my mother, could, could have only tried to begin to imagine the life that I have. And so when I look at them, the, the, what they say to me is, don't you waste too much time in despair. Now you can pass by here if you think you just got to, but you make it a quick trip because, because what do I know? Sojourner Truth couldn't read or write and would travel all over the place and let go of the mule lines and go whichever way the mules went. You are, God is using mules to direct where you are supposed to go. Harriet Tubman worked for the Union Army and they wouldn't even give her food to eat. She had to hustle to get her own food. And I sit with people from Indiana wanting to listen to me. My mother could hardly believe that that folks wanted to listen to me talk because she raised me, you know, it's like, really? Yeah. So, so, so while I can be honest about being tired or being challenged by how long is it going to take for freedom to really come, I can't stay there long because 
it's it, you just get there because you're a human being, but you gotta, it's gotta be a quick trip. It's just gotta be a quick trip. And it's indulgent to, to not let it be a quick trip, you know, to, to admit to, yeah, I'm feeling kind of down. I, at the beginning of COVID, a lot of us just felt a lot of absolute pure grief. And I guess that may be where you were too, just absolute grief. And so I spent a lot of time crying, you know, because you, because you, I just did. And, but even in the midst of all of that, there was always, what is, where's the thread and get back, get, here's the road, get back on it. Don't, don't get too far off of it. This is a poem from John O'Donohue's To Bless the Space Between Us. And it's called For Courage. When the light around you lessens, and the light has certainly lessened for us in the last six months, when the light around you lessens and your thoughts darken until your body feels fear turn cold as a stone inside, when despair comes to visit, when fear turns cold as a stone inside, when you find yourself bereft of any belief in yourself and all you unknowingly leaned on has fallen, when one voice commands your whole heart and it is raven dark, steady yourself and see that it is your own thinking that darkens your world. Search and you will find a diamond thought of light. Know that you are not alone and that this darkness has purpose. Gradually, it will school your eyes to find the one gift your life requires hidden within this night corner. Invoke the learning of every suffering you have suffered. Close your eyes, gather all the kindling about your heart to create one spark. That's all you need, one spark. That's all you need to nourish the flame that will cleanse the dark of its weight of festered fear. A new confidence will come alive to urge you toward higher ground where your imagination will learn to engage difficulty as its most rewarding threshold. That's how you deal with despair. That's how you deal with despair. And if you write it down, the next time despair comes marching up to your door, you can remember what you did the last time and you can go back and read in your journal how you did it the last time. And you know, you get the Psalms praying, uh, always falling back on God's grace. I mean, that's, that's all there is, you know? There is nothing but God's grace and God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And if we, when we get that straight, the rest of it, we can make it. You know, I, I don't wanna be, I love that line that says, you know, not to be put to the, to, to the time of trial. I would like not to have to be Job you know, I don't want to live that, that energy. But if that should come to me, God will be there. I have this quote from C.G. Jung right here over beside my computer that says, bidden or not bidden, God will be present. And God is always present. And because God is present, we can make it. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Meeks. You have attended to our souls tonight. Thank you. Good. good. Yes. It's good to be with you. Well, I look forward to the after times when we can be together in person. But until then, we will use the good technology God gave us to connect yes. and to yes. continue to be working together in this journey, which, you know, God has put us together for such a time as this. And so right. let's rest yes. and keep yes. on moving on. So well, I, I thank you, Bishop Jennifer, and I wish you all a wonderful conference and a co convention. And as you begin, as you get deeper, you didn't do not beginning, but as you get deeper into all of the work in front of you, I wish you great courage <laughs> and strength and uh, going forward in ways that just allow light to shine in Indiana in ways that surprise everybody and it makes God even more happy that you've been put on the earth. So. God be with you all and take good care. Well, thank good, you. Night. Good, night. good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Blessings and peace to you. Thank you for being here tonight.